On occasion, English author, physician, director, renaissance man, wicked mimic, Sir Jonathan Miller states he is done with opera. So far, he has not carried out that threat. He is still hooked on Shakespeare, Lear, Verdi, and the singers and actors who bring magic to the live stage. He started his career in theater with Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett, and Peter Cook in a satirical review called Beyond the Fringe. His passion for science and the arts got him knighted, but he prefers to be called doctor, not sir. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jonathan Miller to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hello. Do you feel more like a doctor than a sir? No, well, I don't any longer feel like a doctor because I haven't had my hands on a patient's belly or chest for a very long time. My interests in, uh, in neurology remain as strong as they were when I first mm. went into medicine in order to do neurology. And it's, it's a skill which is transferable to the theatre. Transferable how? Well, you just have to spend your time watching the minute details of human behavior in order to be a good diagnostician. And that's all that being a director is. It's being a good diagnostician or reminding your performers of the minute details of behavior uh, uh, in order to stop them doing these wild Pilate movements that <laughs> The pass for opera in traditional productions. I think you've called it a Jurassic Park acting well, in the past. There are Jurassic Park singers still. There are fewer of them than there used to be, but they, uh, they always had sort of fatuous ideas about who they were being, and they, they would say, no, Jonathan, I don't think Alfredo would do that. And you said, well, when did you last talk to Alfredo on the subject? And don't you realize He's a fictional character that doesn't exist. We bring him into existence in the course of the production. And would these particular people be opera stars we know or knew? A Pavarotti, a Cecilia Bartoli, a Yes, some of them are. Domingo. I mean, they, yes, there, there are people who would be well known now. Uh, and uh, they are quite difficult to work with because they do it all over the world and they come as late as they possibly can mm -hmm. and s assume that they know who Alfredo or whoever it is they're playing is and they want to, to just say, tell me where I come on and tell me where I go off and uh, I will take care of the rest. As a director, when you're directing someone like that, how do you help the singer connect to his inner self or her inner self to bring out the actor and the opera singer you well, know, what you, make the magic. Well, what you try to do is not to be in a production which has those Jurassic Park performers. <laughs> um, if I know in advance that they're going to be in the production, mm -hmm. I uh, ask not to direct it. Um, I've only once or twice had to work with people like that. Most of the time you work with extremely cooperative, extremely convivial, companionable people who um, like being reminded of what they knew anyway and mm -hmm. had forgotten. Was it your mother, the great fiction writer, who said something like, it's very important to make the negligible considerable yeah. in good fiction? Yes. This is, what I think, does that mean? Well, it's just that most of the things which are recognizable in our life, in our actions, in our performance, uh, are, consist of negligible details. and. Uh, our behavior is nothing more than the sum of all these negligible details, which if you leave them out, you don't get the texture of a human presence. Mm -hmm. uh, so that you have to pay attention to these small details, what it is that people do while they're talking, that they will often be playing with the edge of their jacket or twiddling their ear while they're talking. Or uh, I remember seeing some girls talking to one another on the subway, and one of them was just turning her hair around her index finger while she talked. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what, that's the sort of thing that you have to remind singers about. And of course, our mothers always said to us, stop twirling your hair. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, because they, it, there's the idea that it's, it's not elegant, but it's natural. And uh, it's, there are, of course, hand movements. I've just made one now. Um, but they're very small, the hand movements we, we, we make. And there's a very large, interesting literature on the hand movements that accompany speech. Who uh, on the stage was a natural at figuring that out? A Sir Lawrence Olivier, a Christopher Plummer? Well, Chris Plummer was certainly very natural. Uh, the second time, I worked with him many years ago, first of all, on Danton's death. But when I went to, to Stratford, Ontario, to do King Lear, mm -hmm. um, 
we, t we talked a lot about these little gestures and uh, he, he did them quite naturally. Often it's a question of just reminding them. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he's is such a, a wonderfully naturalistic actor that you hardly have to remind him at all. Every now and then you say, wouldn't it be a good idea if while you're talking you just were playing with your finger on the top of the table. And that little movement mm. makes it real. Well, it's part of, it's the, it isn't the, that single movement, it's the, the idea that there are lots of these movements and these very small movements of the hand that accompany speech. You see, here I am saying, the, the small movements of the hand that accompany mm -hmm. speech. Once people start doing that, it looks as if they're drowning. And it, as you know, uh, so many politicians today, so many people are uh, spun. Uh, there's somebody in the back saying, now when you make a point, do this. And if it's not a natural thing for the politician to do, everybody in the audience is thinking, that's not the truth. No, it is, it's, if, if you ever have to tell people what to do mm -hmm. when, they, when they're talking, um, it would be, I mean, imagine going out into the street and having a conversation with someone and saying, let's go back to the start of this conversation and redo your hand movements. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if we can fix you up. Yes, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's completely unnecessary. There is, as I said, a, a very extensive and interesting literature on the hand movements that accompany speech. Mm and be, they've been classified now, and we know exactly what people do. Well, not, they're all different, but nevertheless, they fall into a, a set of classes of movement. How does uh, the mimic in you help you do what you do? Because you were one of the uh, funniest. Well, I was a funny guy on the satirist. stage a long time ago. Um, I, I suppose the whatever comic sense I had when I was working uh, on the stage doing Beyond the Fringe, to some extent was transferable to the work that I do when I talk to people about their their acting. Mm. Um, but most of the time it's doing what my mother drew my attention to, which is just keeping your eye open and watching what people actually do. I mean, you see, almost all the interesting plays are really about totally forgettable people. I mean, Chekhov, for example, mm. most of these characters, as they say themselves in Three Sisters, five years after their death, they'll be forgotten. Oh, or the cherry orchard? Or the cherry orchard. They mm -hmm. just are forgettable people who are made memorable by the artwork. Uh, La Traviata, which uh, is the opera you're here to do, mm. a love story. The soprano always dies in the end. Yes, <laughs> but uh, she dies in my particular production without running around the stage halfway through and doing a lap of honor. <laughs> I mean, I've seen productions in which she gets out of bed and runs around the room. Well as I always remind the diva who's playing the part, or mm -hmm. the actress, the singer, I said, dying is a full-time business and you stay in bed to do it and the chances are that you'd be incontinent and I don't want you whittling all over the floor, thank <laughs> you very much. That's the doctor in you, <laughs> yes. isn't it? Well, I've seen people dying and I know what people mm. do. And in the interesting operas where people die, La Boheme, for example, for, for the moment, no one in the room sees her die. It's the only the orchestra that tells you there's a sighing sound. Right. And it's only about 30 seconds later that someone walks past her bed and says, she's gone. She's gone. And that beautiful score, Puccini's beautiful score, uh, La Boheme, uh, adds to it. But you're right. If you're going to die, you have to die right. Yes, you've got to die right. And it, it's very interesting how often the dying person is impatient with the attentive uh, uh, sort of movements of the of the of the, of the loved one, mm -hmm. and they will often say, "Yes, I, no, no, please don't do that. I, I'm, I'm busy. I'm dying. But please, I know you mean well, but uh, and suddenly, scarcely noticing, they're not there, mm. and that's it. Mm -hmm. And it's nice if somebody dies in your arms." Well, for us, it is or maybe in it's some not. sense, but it, 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 uh, it's, it may be nice, but there are so many mm. cases in which I've seen uh, being in the ward when relatives or loved ones, as they're so often called, are been there for six hours and they're standing side by side looking out of the window because time has passed and what do you do? And uh, they turn around and the patient is dead. Mm -hmm or you go for dinner. I don't know what that's about. You go for dinner and think, we'll come back yes, you know, right after right. dinner. And the minute, not the minute, but right after, my mother did that. Mm. And 
we wondered if we should feel guilty about it, no, or no. would she be happy we'd no, gone to dinner and we're having it, fine it, wine, it, and it's just that, she uh, went off. Dying, like many of the things that we do, often happens without drama. I mean, there are obviously moments of mm -hmm. high drama and shrieking and desperation and loud grieving on the part of the, of the dying as well. But so often, the most noticeable thing, I think, is when you do it with, with extraordinary reticence, and then it's mm -hmm. rather interesting. Mm. Reluctance. Uh, your cultural odyssey began because your neighbor called you and asked you to direct, <laughs> direct an opera, or what happened? Well, yes, this was Roger Norrington. Um, I had never, I'd never even seen an opera before, and uh, Norrington, who you know, has become since a very great conductor, he, he lived near me in uh, North London, and he called me and said, would you like to come and direct an opera for this group called the Kent Opera? And I said, well, I've never directed an, an opera, uh, and I've never even seen one, and I can't read music, and he assured me that he could, and then said, uh, well, I, come, I think you might be able to do it since I've seen you direct plays, and it's not that different. And it's not. I discovered that it isn't that different. I mean, people overestimate the distinction between talking and singing. Mm. And talking, in, in fact, is itself a form of singing. It has prosody, it has intonations and so forth, D different from singing, but nevertheless, they are related to one another. What was your first opera? Corsi Fantuiti. Oh, mm. the, the kind of the, mis it's a comedy, really. Well, it's or is it? Well, You'll tell me something different. I think it is a comedy with a, a strange sort of tragedy built into it. I mean, people think of it as a, as a comedy about infidelity, and actually, mm -hmm. it's a much more interesting uh, drama about identity, um, about the risks of going into disguise and discovering that the anonymity which your disguise gives you allows you to bring out aspects of your own personality I which see. you would otherwise be ashamed mm -hmm. of. Or testing somebody's fidelity right. in a very tricky but, way. But, but you're testing your own fidelity. Mm. That's why people have masked balls, is that people who believe themselves to be masked can actually do things which they'd be ashamed to do if they were recognizable. It happens at Halloween. Yes, it, of course it does. And mm -hmm. that's exactly what Cozy is about. The boys actually turn out to be um, discoverers of aspects of their own personality which they wouldn't have suspected. Mm. And actually, they show their own infidelity and aspects of their own character which they wouldn't have suspected when they were recognizable. And that again I was inspired by a book that my mother wrote. She wrote a book just after the war. She was struck by the fact that my father's colleagues, my father was a doctor, who behaved with you know, propriety when they were in civilian clothes, got into army costume and so because they thought they were no longer recognizable began to misbehave themselves in all sorts of ways. Do you help uh, somebody uh, become a better soldier by putting them in uniform, do you think? Or no, you I think said your happened, father I, probably acted out more in the bar or something because he well, was in uniform or I'm no, not, I think I my don't father get the didn't, point. My father, I don't think, did misbehave himself. Well, he may, have, he may have done, but I never found out. But I do think that what happens is that um, as the man I much admire, Irving Goffman, pointed mm. out, performances um, are determined, what one does, are very largely determined by what you believe yourself to be in the frame of. And if you're in the frame of mm. being military, aspects of yourself become more apparent than they would have done if you believed yourself to be in the frame of simply being a uh, a consultant physician. Mm. And we on the other side, if, for instance, if you go through a border and somebody's in a customs uniform, there's something about me that thinks I've done something wrong, and I haven't. That's right. What do you right? say? But there's a whole the, the, the whole question of uniforms, um, which confer upon the wearer a special sort of authority, which he or she would not have if, in fact, they were not wearing that uniform. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, welcome back, and we will talk about La Traviata, Dr. Jonathan Miller, our guest. Dr. Jonathan Miller, our guest, is in Vancouver to uh, direct La Traviata for Glimmer Glass. It's a co-production, really. It's Glimmer Glass Opera in Cooperstown, New York, and uh, the Vancouver Opera. How's it going so far? 
Well, I think it's, uh, it's I'm, I'm very pleased with it. I think all the, uh, the performers are ext extraordinarily uh, uh, talented and uh, reticent in a way that I want on the stage. Mm. And the chorus is one of the best choruses I've worked with. Really? Oh yeah, they're and wonderful. They're very individual, at the same time not pushy, but they mm. somehow produce individuality on the stage, which I th find very important in and, a chorus. And when uh, we leave La Traviata, what do you want us to think about? Oh, All going well. I'm not certain I ever have a, a particular idea about what I want people to think about. Again, I would like to draw attention to things which most opera productions of Traviata don't draw your attention to, which is why it is that uh, Alfredo and Violetta have this peculiar, almost instantaneous affinity for one another. Mm. And I think it's really rather like a Flaubert novel. It's like uh, uh, L'Education Sentimentale, in which both of them are creatures who are unfamiliar with that, well, as Violetta mm. says, this, this desert they call Paris. She's a provincial girl who recognizes in Alfredo another provincial and that they are sort of made mm. for each other. Here she is, uh, has been patronized and picked up by, by the Baron. Uh, She's a courtesan, right? She's a courtesan. And actually, recognizing this boy, Alfredo, who comes from Provence, uh, they recognize that they're made for each other and that they live in the country as they, the couple do in, uh, in the Flaubert novel. Yes, and, moved right in. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's, a, it's much more naturalistic, I think, if you play it like that. And uh, again, it's about negligible and forgettable people, mm -hmm. a group of rich, silly people, uh, amongst whom there are these rather, this rather interesting couple. Interesting because they are so unlike the company they keep mm -hmm. in the early part of the opera. And yet she is willing to give him up. Well, it's because she gets... Under duress. Yeah, she gets bullied into giving it up. But I think something interesting begins to occur also with Germain, the father of Alfredo. Uh, he comes in in a high dudgeon thinking that he's addressing a sort of whorish courtesan and mm -hmm. suddenly confronts this extraordinarily chaste and uh, reticent young woman. And I think that he suddenly falls in love with her just as much as Alfredo really? did. And I, uh, I played around with the idea that it's possible in 1850 when childbearing was a risky business that mm -hmm. he probably lost his wife bearing their third mm. child and suddenly saw mm. her. I have him, while he's talking to her, playing idly with the wedding ring on his finger and looking at it and suddenly realizing this girl is so like the girl I married and lost. Really? And, and she needs freedom, it seems to me, mm. to survive, to exist. Yes. It's, and it's very early, was what, 1800s? Well, 1850, and uh, th 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 these girls were picked up in, in you know, dress shops and costume shops by, uh, just as young ballet dancers were picked mm -hmm. up by aristocracy, who would hang around in the wings of uh, ballets mm -hmm. and pick up girls who were themselves usually working class girls. Uh, as one of the world's eminent directors, do you have a favorite piece you've directed, a f some favorite moments, a favorite opera house, a La Scala, the Met? No, I, I have. Uh, there are operas I like particularly, and which I, to which I've returned many times. Cosi fan tutti. I've done almost five different productions of it. I again, I'm interested in this question of disguise, and uh, I did it when I first did it. Uh, for the Royal Opera House, I, I got Armani to do the costumes. And well, were, you did, and they were quite. You just say hello, Giorgio. Well, no, Sir, they they rang Sir up. Jonathan here. No, I didn't. I didn't do it myself. I, I mean, it was. I was asked to do a production and uh, on someone else's set, and I said, well, I, I don't want to do that, and and they said, well, what? Uh, we can't afford new costumes. I said, well, just go and ask someone like Armani whether you couldn't. <laughs> get him mm -hmm. for his publicity, he'd be pleased to, uh, to, to have costumes f which he could boast right. of being on the stage. And we had them. But after one series, we, we stopped them. And I changed my mind about how people should look anyway, so that when the boys come back, uh, apparently, you know, 
in disguise, instead of having them as Albanians, whatever they look like, mm -hmm. um, they come back as heavy metal bikers now. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Uh, or hip hoppers, yeah, rappers. That's, that's right. Heavy metal bikers. Yeah, that's right. How and, great. You know, so the door opens and mm. they're, they're there with their headscarves and going, hey, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yo. <laughs> yo. Yo. Uh, uh, the photographer in you, how, how do you use that when you're directing it? You're well, so visual. It's, um, I've been influenced all my life by the history of painting and photography, mm -hmm. and certainly when I've done productions, I have been very influenced by uh, photographs of one period or another. When I'm doing something in a, say, well, a bohème that I did recently, I, I set it in Paris in 1930, and I based it on those wonderful photographs of, by Kertesz, mm -hmm those monochrome pictures with overweight whores standing on the corner, backlit. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and certainly there are pictures in this Traviata which are very much based on uh, Nadar's photographs and also on the, the, the paintings that you have in the 1850s in Paris salons. Um, the visual is a very important mm -hmm. part of my uh, um, of my production. Yes, very much so. Sir Lawrence uh, Olivier, I think, said to you once uh, yeah. about Merchant of Ven Venice, dear boy, this is a very difficult play. Yes. Did he? Yeah, when he said, dear, dear boy, he said, we must um, be very careful with this most awkward of all plays. He said, uh, we must at all costs avoid offending the Hebrews. God, I love them so. <laughs> God, he does. So, um, back to Beyond the Fringe. Do you mm. miss it? Do you ever think about it much? Do you watch it? No, no, I haven't watched it for years. I mean, it's printed on my brain, I suppose, because mm. we did it, you know, for so many... Well, we did it for a year in London and 18 months on Broadway mm. so that uh, I can remember all the lines that we ever uttered and I can remember some of the funnier lines that we did. And they, they're very... And, but I mostly remember, most strongly, not what I did, but I used to stand in the wings and watch Peter Cook, who I thought was extraordinarily funny. That little monologue he did about the man who said, oh, I, I could have been a judge, but I never had the Latin for the judge in exams. He said, they're very unrigorous, the judge in exams. He said, they only ask you one question. Who are you? And I got 75% on that. <laughs> but you see, I just watched him inventing this. I'm oh, sure. And, uh, and I mean, I can remember, you know, some of the lines we did, but it's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was an important part of my life, partly because, of course, it disrupted my determination to be a neurologist. A doctor. How, how, how did it change British comedy? I'm not certain. I think it probably, I don't think it, it changed it, but I think we ourselves were the expression of something which was changing in British theatre in the early... 1960s, all sorts of uh, standards and compunctions that people had about decency, obscenity, uh, respectability mm -hmm. and so forth were changing. John Osborne's plays were changing what was happening. Um, things were happening in which people were much less respectful of the ruling class, for mm -hmm. example, um, as a result of the, the Suez adventures and things like that. Right. And I think probably that although we made a contribution towards something which was perhaps followed up and consummated in many ways by Monty Python and so forth, I think all of us were the expressions of something which was going on in English culture between about, I think, really about 1955 mm -hmm. and 1960 or early 60s, um, life underwent a change uh, that uh, uh, teenagers um, began to dress characteristically in their own clothes of their own choice rather than wearing either juvenile clothes or adult clothes. They could choose things mm -hmm. of their own. Everything underwent a change. Permission, the permissive society it was called. Sure. Um, all that happened, I think, probably as the long-term consequence of everything that occurred as a result of the disruptions, the social disruptions of the Second World War. And then the Beatles grew their hair well, and caused a stir, and now Wells and Kate have been living together before yes, the wedding. That's right. Well, so that I think that all sorts of fundamental, again to quote Irving Goffman, fundamental frames became blurred or enlarged or bracketed in different ways mm. and permission uh, 
was introduced which would have appalled uh, predecessors of, say, 50 years earlier. I'm assuming you're not going to the royal wedding. No, I'm, I'm bored by it. I'm, I'm rather glad to be here, away, you know, a thousand miles from what's going on. It's <laughs> such a silly business. Silly. The royal silly or the wedding silly? What's silly about it to you? Well, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm totally uninterested in this couple. Um, mm. And I think on the whole, although there's a certain advantage in monarchy, it isn't a very important part of, of many people's lives. And I don't think that British democracy uh, is held together um, by Her Majesty and her descendants. Have you told her that? I haven't said it to her face. <laughs> oh, no. How nice to see you. How nice, nice to, to meet you. you. Thank you. A La Traviata, Vancouver Opera, Glimmerglass Opera co-production, directed by Sir Jonathan Miller, Dr. Jonathan Miller, who would still perhaps like to operate on a brain or not. No, I didn't want to operate on a brain. I want to watch people and discuss and investigate what happens when people's brains are damaged. Okay, so like neuropsychology. Yeah, the neuropsychology. Because your father was a psychiatrist, right? Yes, he so was. that neuropsychology of it all. Yeah. Which you do a little bit. All the time on the stage, on the stage yes. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. Uh, Cecilia Bartoli. Uh, yes, some of them are. Domingo. I mean, the, yes, the, the, there are people who uh, w w would be well known now. Uh, and. Uh, they are quite difficult to work with because they do it all over the world and they come as late as they possibly can mm -hmm. and s assume that they know who Alfredo or whoever it is they're playing is and they want to, to just say, tell me where I come on and tell me where I go off and uh, I will take care of the rest. As a director, when you're directing someone like that, how do you help the singer connect to his inner self or her inner self to bring out the actor and the opera singer you well, know, what you make the magic. Well, what you try to do is not to be in a production which has those Jurassic Park <laughs> performers. Um, if I know in advance that they're going to be in the production, mm -hmm. I uh, ask not to direct it. Um, I've only once or twice had to work with people like that. Most of the time you work with extremely cooperative, extremely convivial, companionable people who um, like being reminded of what they knew anyway and mm -hmm. had forgotten. Was it your mother, the great fiction writer, who said something like, it's very important to make the negligible considerable yeah. in good fiction? Yes. On occasion, English author, physician, director, renaissance man, wicked mimic, Sir Jonathan Miller states he is done with opera. So far, he has not carried out that threat. He is still hooked on Shakespeare, Lear, Verdi, and the singers and actors who bring magic to the live stage. He started his career in theater with Dudley Moore, Alan Bennett, and Peter Cook in a satirical review called Beyond the Fringe. His passion for science and the arts got him knighted, but he prefers to be called doctor, not sir. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Jonathan Miller to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hello. Do you feel more like a doctor than a sir? No, I don't any longer feel like a doctor because I haven't had my hands on a patient's belly or chest for a very long time. My interests in, uh, in neurology remain as strong as they were when I first mm. went into medicine in order to do neurology. And it's, it's a skill which is transferable to the theatre. Transferable how? Well, you just have to spend your time watching the minute details of human behavior in order to be a good diagnostician. And that's all that being a director is. It's being a good diagnostician or reminding your performers of the minute details of behavior uh, uh, in order to stop them doing these wild Pilate movements that <laughs> The pass for opera in traditional productions. I think you've called it a Jurassic Park acting well, in the past. There are Jurassic Park singers still. There are fewer of them than there used to be, but they, uh, they always had sort of fatuous ideas about who they were being, and they, they would say, no, Jonathan, I don't think Alfredo would do that. And you said, well, when did you last talk to Alfredo on the subject? And don't you realize He's a fictional character that doesn't exist. We bring him into existence in the course of the production. And would these particular people be opera stars we know or knew, a Pavarotti, a 